Okay, good. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jacob. The floor is yours. Thank you for your okay, Thanks. Everyone can see me and hear me okay? Yes. Um, good. So um, I'm going to be presenting on, on this uh, manuscript recently published. I, I'm just um, really glad Fritz is here as well because uh, he um, really did most of the conceptualization, uh, essentially all of the programming. Uh, and, and I think uh, Amras really uh, excited to have worked with him on this project uh, and uh, be presenting on, on behalf of our group, which is a large collaboration of uh, machine learning scientists and geneticists and biologists. Um, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history in a second. Um, but I, when this project started, I was a postdoc in Party Savetti's lab. And um, it was, uh, I'd say six months into the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, we had spent the first six months trying to sequence as many viral genomes as we could. Um, and I, I have to apologize because I, I have I've been infected with another non-COVID virus. So I'm actually glad that we're not doing this in person, but you'll have to forgive me if uh, I'm coughing or have a really hoarse voice uh, during the talk. Um, but, uh, in, in any event, um, we sequenced as many SARS-CoV-2 genomes as we could. And I, I think that the, you know, the finding from the first six months of the pandemic genetic analysis was sort of like, there wasn't a lot of genetic variation actually. And um, we didn't think that uh, the virus was going to mutate uh, to the extent that it did. But that was probably naive. Um, in retrospect, it was, it was clearly wrong. In the fall of um, 2020, it sort of became clear how wrong it was. Um, and what you're seeing here on the left is the uh, relative frequency of the genotype of the B117 variant, uh, or the alpha variant that emerged in initially in the fall of 2020, and then seemed to have this like, exponential growth in the population, and then it essentially took over. Um, and actually, in retrospect, this had happened earlier with another mutation, D614G. But it also happened, um, it started happening again and again. And here at right is just a plot of similar in South Africa. Um, you can see the allele frequency or the genotype frequency of uh, B1351 or the beta variant in South Africa. Similar kind of thing in the fall of 2020, kind of emerged and then it increased in frequency and seemed to seem to take over. The uncertainty uh, is larger on the right because we just had less sequencing data from South Africa at the time. But this story played out again and again and, and in fact kept playing out. And I think this is um, really when um, you know Fritz and I and other people on the team first met and started talking about this problem. Like, how can we forecast that these variants are, are coming? How can we identify what's concerning? And how can we um, forecast the dynamics that, that, that may play out? Now, it turns out that this um, uh, pattern of <clears throat> rapid growth to fixation actually wasn't coincidental, that there's fundamental biology here. And um, it is a, uh, um, I wouldn't say it's a well-known result, but it's an established result in population genetics um, uh, that uh, when genotypes compete, um, the, uh, the relative uh, fitness uh, of the fitter, uh, the fitter genotype will outcompete the less fit genotype and the dynamics will follow a logistic growth curve. Um, and uh, here, uh, I think this is, I'm not sure what the primordial citation is, but it, it was established in, in Crow and Kimura's book in, in the 70s. Actually, this is from, from Wikipedia. But if you just say, okay, there's two alleles, there's P and Q. And what I want to know is what is the change in allele frequency in a single generation, this um, delta P here. And I'm gonna assume that the P genotype has fitness of W and that it is fitter than uh, the average of the two genotypes in the population, we're going to define that as the selection coefficient S, then this is approximately equal to the selection coefficient times the frequency of P times uh, the frequency of Q, which is just 
one minus p. And, and there isn't anything, uh, uh, and, and, and when, you, when you pass to the continuum limit here, uh, you, you get a differential equation that describes logistic growth. There isn't anything profound about this really, except to say that uh, the genotypes compete with each other. There's only so much pi to go around and it's a multiplicative growth between generations. So you get this uh, logistic curve. And um, in fact, this is an empirical uh, observation that is consistently observed over and over again. Um, by the time we had much better sequencing data, this is the Delta variant um, passing through, taking over in our region uh, in the spring of 2021, um, over a year ago now. Uh, you can see this uh, logistic growth played out um, across you know, six nearby states uh, or five nearby states, including Massachusetts. And just about everywhere you look, you see this logistic growth playing out. So this was the initial conversation that we um, started to have. Uh, I would say Fritz and I started to have along with other people in the team. And it was around this time that uh, when we were having the conversation because the, the, um, the team that had created Pyro um, initially developed at Uber AI. Um, uh, three of them, uh, Fritz and Martin uh, Jankowiak and Eli Bingham, uh, had actually come to the Broad Institute as machine learning fellows. And so we just started to talk with them. Um, are, are there ways that we could apply um, uh, Pyro to viral genetics? And um, really kind of focused in on this question of, uh, you know, what's driving this logistic growth? Is this something that we can model? The other part of this that went into the conversation is that when you see these variants emerge and they've emerged again and again, the patterns of mutation um, are actually shared between them. So here's a mutation like D614G. Um, it's shared by every variant of concern that's ever emerged. Here's N501Y. This is shared by a lot of variants of concern. So there are stereotypical patterns, T470K, um, these kind of mutations that are recurrent and appear to be driving uh, the fitness advantage of strains. So um, we asked the question, can we design a model where we could actually work out um, which mutations were driving fitness. And the approach, the old approach that we had been using in viral genetics is um, basically first build a phylogenetic tree of all the sequences and then um, try to use things like the, the coalescent um, or other um, kind of aspects of the evolutionary process to understand things like the uh, size of the population or the selection on the population. And as the number of viral genomes um, for SARS-CoV-2 was passing the hundreds of thousands and then the millions, it became clear that this was going to be completely a non-starter. So um, Fritz then uh, came one day and said, I, I have this idea of how to overcome this problem. And we, uh, we can take the whole database um, cluster it into lineages and um, look at the relative uh, change in frequency of those lineages across space and across time. And um, said, okay, you know, that sounds great. Um, and can we turn this into a regression problem where actually we're representing each mutation uh, or each lineage? as a combination of the mutations that make it up. And um, then uh, uh, you know, Fritz kind of uh, formulated this, this model and-, um, and Well, to be, to, be, to be fair, the, the regression idea was Jacob's. So it was really a synthesis of like scientists and, and uh, computer scientists. Yeah, it was, it was a good, it was a good conversation, but um, so, we came together, and and but the implementation here was was definitely Fritz's. Um, and the the I think the incredible thing is that this is exactly the kind of my model that Pyro was was built for. Um, and we'll talk more about that in in a second. So here's the model. 
Um, and the priors are on the right, and uh, the, the <clears throat> guts of the model is on the left. Um, but the priors were basically chosen to be uninformative, um, except uh, we, we did a, a little bit of work to define this um, uh, regularization parameter for the per mutation um, fitness effects. Uh, that that was chosen through a through a, a dedicated analysis, but the 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 critical parts of the model uh, are here, and the basic idea is to build this large hierarchical Bayesian regression model where the observed values are um, the absolute case counts at a given time in a given place uh, for. Uh, a, a given uh, cluster. And um, this is a vectored observation where uh, there's, there's a vector, in this case, there's 3,000 clusters. Um, and uh, that is modeled as being multinomial where the probability um, of being a, of a given uh, vector of lineages uh, has some initial intercept uh, plus a, a region-specific and uh, strain-specific growth rate um, uh, uh, that uh, dictates the probability of observing the strain over time. The key feature of this model is that the strain-specific growth rate is a linear combination of the features or the mutations that uh, comprise that lineage. And it's a, um, <clears throat> I think there are uh, 3,000 uh, uh, clusters or strains, um, and there are roughly uh, um, uh, 2,000 uh, features. So it's a, it's a very large, uh, high-dimensional hierarchical model. Um, and this is- Jacob, uh, Just a, a quick question. So um, am I right that- uh, that implies that the fitness effects of these mutation features are independent of each other. And is that like biologically what happens? So exactly. Uh, that is what it, impl it implies. I think to a first approximation, it's um, likely very good. Um, but we're also seeing that in, in many places, that's probably not completely true. In other words, um, there are mutations that seem to confer a fitness advantage. Things like the mutation E484K, for example, uh, that tend not to arise on, uh, on all backgrounds. So there does seem to be some um, uh, basis for interaction between the mutations, a, a biological basis for interaction, which we call epistasis um, in genetics language. But I think um, as a first approximation, this is um, a, a reasonably simple model that does seem to capture the dynamics um, of, of the different strains over time. So uh, I think as a modeling assumption, it's, it's a reasonable and a starting point, but, but when you really get down to it, it's probably violated uh, in, in practice. Cool. That's totally reasonable. Uh, great. Yeah. So I say, feel free as questions come up. Um, feel free to to go ahead and and uh, shout them out. Um, uh, this it's really great to have Fritz here as well because this is a a really um, I, I would say uh, a multidisciplinary project and um, and so the questions can come from uh, I say you know various. Uh, biological or machine learning directions, and, and we can just kind of talk about um, uh, the decisions we made and, and potential next steps. Um, <clears throat> but so this is for me where I, I just was completely blown away by 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 Pyro's ability. I mean, we we would you know try to write these or just just try to uh, implement much much uh, smaller multinomial logistic regression models in, in say R. And these things just, they just wouldn't, wouldn't run. Um, and uh, Fritz's implementation of this model in Pyro um, was so efficient and um, it, it ran in 11 minutes and uh, was able to fit this model. Um, so I think for, for uh, those of you who are not familiar with Pyro uh, and that I guess is my, I would suspect many of you, I'm probably not the best person to um, 
to, to explain Pyro to you, but it's a probabilistic programming language that is uh, designed to um, uh, build and implement probabilistic models like Bayesian regression models. Uh, and uh, the inference, the estimation of the posterior um, can be done by many ways, uh, but Pyro is particularly good at implementing um, a variational inference, which is uh, a way of, uh, rather than sampling from the posterior distribution, um, like most um, MCMC approaches, uh, pyro um, or variational inference actually um, exactly uh, solves uh, for an approximate distribution for the posterior um, uh, in, uh, in the form of um, minimizing the uh, distance uh, using uh, uh, KL divergence between this guide distribution and, and the true posterior. And Pyro is able to do this really efficiently because it is built on PyTorch and takes advantage of the um, efficient computational uh, abilities of, of PyTorch, uh, in particular, its automatic differentiation uh, abilities and its efficient data structures. So I think really the one of the key advances is just being able to formulate this model and perform inference on such a large data set with such a large um, high dimensional model, but to yield something that uh, we think uh, biologically uh, provides a lot of insight. So here are the results of the model. Um, <clears throat> what you have here on the x-axis is the relative uh, fitness. And, and again, this is this uh, these beta sub uh, F, um, these are the feature specific fitnesses uh, of the individual amino acid substitutions that make up a variant. And on the y-axis is some measure of statistical significance. And this is a volcano plot and things that we think are um, you know, highly likely to have a large effect on fitness are things that are in the top right quadrant. And um, the color of the mutations here corresponds to the different um, genes or open reading frames that these mutations are found in. Um, I think the first thing to note is that most of these hits are red. And red in this case corresponds to the spike gene. We'll go into this a little more in a second, but um, the first way to kind of aggregate uh, this data um, and understand the, what it's telling us about the dynamics of the pandemic uh, is, is to aggregate the mutations into uh, the lineages that we observe um, in the population and to assign based on uh, this linear combination of mutation specific coefficients a fitness for each lineage. And um, this plot is a, a, a little complicated so I'm gonna walk you through it, but on the x-axis you have the date that the lineage first emerged in the population, um, the birthday of the lineage. And on the y-axis, you have the uh, relative um, fitness of the lineage. Each dot corresponds to a particular lineage that was observed in the population, and the size of the dot corresponds to the total number of cases uh, that, that were uh, estimated in, in the population. Um, the color, uh, the red are the variants of concern, and the, the green are, are this former title is variant of, of interest, but. Um, Almost everything now is, is called a variant of concern. But I think several things are, are notable about this, about this plot. First is that it was a relatively sort of boring pandemic uh, up until the fall of 2020, where the relative fitness of lineages was um, pretty consistent. And then the pandemic seemed to go through this period of relatively rapid evolution with the emergence of multiple variants of concern um, the beta, the variant, the alpha variant, the delta variant. Um, and then uh, delta, you know, fractured into sub lineages. And the pandemic after the spring of 2021 went to, to this relatively quiescent period again, where, uh, where most of the descendant lineages were delta and the fitness was relatively consistent. And going back to the question about whether the mutations are, um, are, are independent, 
we actually think that that this is an example of the of the non-independence of mutations. In other words, there's something about the delta uh, background that is just not um, uh, 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 suitable or does not accommodate uh, have a large capacity uh, for the addition of fitness enhancing mutations. Now that's somewhat speculative, but I but I think there are there are multiple examples where we're of seeing that effect. Um, <clears throat> we first actually- Jacob, just oh. very quickly, what is the mm. y-axis, sorry? I think um, I didn't get that. Our, the the y-axis is, is the growth rate. It's growth. the relative fitness okay. of the variance. Okay. When we first fit the model, it's actually kind of around, around here. Um, it was in, in the summer of, of 2021. And I thought, I think many people thought that, that this was it, that there had been this period of rapid evolution and then we had reached this plateau, the virus, you know, Delta was kind of the pinnacle of fitness. Um, and then of course, uh, Thanksgiving of 2021, everything changed uh, and com completely out of left field was this incredible quantum leap in growth rate. Uh, due to the Omicron variant. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that this model did really, really accurately was forecast the future dominance of BA2, which was at the time an obscure sublineage of BA1 that no one had ever heard of. But um, uh, the model suggested that, that BA2 was actually quite a bit fitter than, than BA1. Um, and that, that turned out to be accurate uh, several months into advance, in, in, in advance. But here is that volcano plot laid out across the viral genome. And I think this is where um, the biological insights of the model really shine through. Um, across the x-axis here, this is the genome space of the virus. So these are the actual genes in the virus. And then here is the estimate of relative fitness uh, for the individual um, mutational coefficients in the model. Uh, what you can see is that there are actually clusters, there are peaks of uh, fitness in the virus uh, where uh, mutations in these regions seem to have an outsized effect on the growth rate. And the mutations um, in these regions seem to be the ones uh, at position E484, uh, N501, um, T478, uh, these are the positions that um, really seem to be associated with the emergence of these variants of concern. Within Spike, um, models suggested that uh, there were kind of three major places. One was this uh, receptor binding domain, the interface of Spike and ACE2. The other was this N-terminal domain. Um, and then a third region was this uh, furin cleavage site, um, which is also a hotspot of evolution. But the advantage of having a genome-wide model is that it allowed us to ask in an agnostic sense, I mean, I think the whole world was focusing on spike, but it allowed us to ask in an agnostic sense, what outside of spike is also driving fitness? And, and that's where I think the results really surprised us. Um, in particular, there's this hotspot in the nucleocapsid that seemed to be a strong peak of fitness. And um, actually Jennifer, Jennifer Dowda's group um, Last year had a, had a paper in science around the same time that we saw this result showing that if you inserted these mutational changes into this um, viral particle, you could actually enhance the packaging of the virus and increase fitness that way. So um, the hits in spike are relatively well characterized. The hits in N, I think we have some idea of what's going on. Uh, there seem to be some strong hits in ORF3A. And then there, there are a series of other hits uh, here in, in this large polypeptide ORF1A that really represent, um, I would say, completely unexplored biology. Um, and from the viral genetics perspective, I think this is really a gold mine um, to start thinking about uh, what changes outside of spike mechanistically drive fitness. We then asked the question, what is it about these mutations that enhance viral infectivity? Um, or, or that enhance fitness. And, and in particular, are these mutations just making the virus more infectious per se, which is, are, is the virus just better able to replicate and get inside cells? 
Um, Jeremy Luban's lab did an experiment um, where they inserted some of these changes into uh, pseudovirus particles and found that some like N501Y um, did in fact um, enhance infectivity, but others like E484K, T478K, these are some of the top hits. They actually didn't increase infectivity per se. We took advantage of um, data from Jesse Bloom lab, Jude Bloom's lab that had um, measured the binding to a large panel of antibodies and aggregated this data into an escape calculator to predict the binding of mutant virus to the receptor binding domain. And we asked, is predicted binding here on the y-axis um, at all associated with the apparent fitness that's attributed to the receptor binding domain portion of the virus uh, uh, via the uh, pyarnal model. And we were surprised actually to see this strong correlation with the Omicron variants on the top right, some of the earlier variants on the bottom left, suggesting that a lot of this growth rate advantage could be attributable, at least within spike, to the loss of uh, binding of antibodies that would neutralize the virus. And um, we were able to uh, break this out over time. Um, this is an analysis that, that uh, Martin led, and I think it really explains kind of what's going on in the pandemic, where <clears throat> looking at uh, fitness-specific effects in S here, over time, you see this um, initial stability of fitness, this rapid increase in fitness, um, this apparent plateau, and then this explosion of fitness out of left field with the Omicron variants in uh, after Thanksgiving of 2021. Um, within RBD, we see the same pattern, but outside of spike, um, we really don't see uh, this addition of fitness effects um, outside of S. And what it, what it really told us is that there was a kind of phase transition in the pandemic, that there was enough immunity in the population that transmission or fitness in the population was now dominated by a virus's ability to evade the immune system rather than its ability to infect cells, infect naive hosts. Um, so I think there's a lot of other data points uh, that, that kind of support this idea, but, um, but, but this uh, genome-wide, um, you know, somewhat uh, agnostic approach to, to modeling fitness I think offered a really compelling way, um, way to, to see this. We asked a related question, um, which is, you know, is there heterogeneity within a branch of the phylogenetic tree? Uh, that is looking within clusters, um, you know, for example, Delta or B1617.2, actually has a collection of sublineages associated with it. Is there uh, variability in the relative fitness of those clusters? And um, what we found was, was actually really striking, which is that um, sublineages like Delta had a relatively um, low variability uh, set of sublineages whose relative fitness was all clustered around consistent values. In contrast, there were some lineages like the precursor to, to Omicron, this B.1.1 lineage, that seemed to have a long tail of fitness, high variability in the, the relative fitness of their descendant sublineages. Um, it speaks to uh, the fact that uh, we think potentially um, some lineages are more likely to omit uh, variants of concern or highly uh, fit uh, sublineages than others. But it also gets back to this question of epistasis or genetic interaction um, between variants that, that seems to be um, present in various ways in, in the data. Um, so we actually continue to run uh, PyRO, um, or sorry, Pi or not. Um, I, I should say, you know, we chose. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't sure what to call this. Um, Pi R was kind of a joke uh, at the time, but, but we sort of stuck with it. And um, I think one thing I do want to make clear is that we're not actually modeling R0. 
I, we thought maybe that we, we were when we started the project, but it, it's, it's actually clear that, that this is not modeling a virus's inherent ability to infect a naive population of hosts, which is the definition of R0. This is really uh, measuring relative fitness, or another way to say that would be growth rate in the population. But nonetheless, uh, we couldn't come up with a better name um, and, uh, and so pi are not stuck, but we, we can here to run this model. Um, here's a run from earlier in the week. Uh, and um, on the x-axis here is the relative fitness and on the y-axis uh, is just the, the estimated number of cases. Um, and you can see uh, this, um, these are the Omicron lineages, BA1, um, uh, BA2 is, is yet, you know, uh, quantum uh, more uh, uh, trans fit than, than BA1. And, and here is this BA4-5 lineage that's, that's now um, causing a, a wave um, across the world, including in the U.S. Um, and then here are the, the mutational, um, the, the fitness of the uh, mutation-specific uh, coefficients. And, um, you know, it's, it's actually largely consistent uh, with now over 10 million uh, genomes, um, it still runs uh, relatively quickly. Um, and it highlights the fact that, that uh, a, a small number of mutations, uh, mutational changes within Spike uh, continues to, to drive the pandemic. Um, in the last, um, I would say, I want to make sure we leave time for questions and discussion. Um, and um, um, I'm just looking at the chat. Okay, nothing. Uh, no one likes the pun. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and uh, so no questions in the chat. So in the last, I'd say, 10 minutes, I, I, I kind of want to talk about um, uh, Martin's model a little bit and just kind of tease that and then just give a bit of, of uh, perspective and, and context. So um, I think the one kind of major limitation of pi r naught um, that, that uh, that I, I, I think we really came across is that the, the uncertainties for the coefficients are, are probably unrealistically small. We think they're useful for kind of ranking um, from, a, from a standpoint of experimental characterization, which we have stronger confidence than in than others. But, but to actually extract a meaningful um, credible interval or confidence interval uh, on these uncertainties um, that describes uh, you know the real uncertainty around their effect. Um, I, I think the the model um, it doesn't it doesn't do you know do that so well. A related uh, issue is that um, the Manhattan plot is noisy, and um, this is somewhat by design, uh, in that um, you know it really is a question of regularization, and the more we regularize, the uh, cleaner the Manhattan plot gets. But we do um, there's a trade off, and we do uh, lose. Um, uh, some of the fitting of the most recent uh, and potentially most significant dynamics um, in, in the pandemic. A related issue, and I'm not sure if this is a feature or a bug or, or neutral, but um, some hits we, we actually just can't figure out what they're doing. Uh, so the, the, the hit that seems to have the, the biggest effect is this T478K uh, mutation, which um, uh, doesn't seem to uh, enhance escape from antibodies, and it doesn't seem to infect, increase uh, infectivity per se. So it may just be kind of along for the ride or something that serves as a capacitor uh, for other mutations and allows them to stabilize. Again, getting to this, um, this issue of interactions between, um, between mutations. So around the time that we... Um, put the first version of this manuscript on by our archive, a, a little word after um, uh, this group uh, led uh, from uh, John Barton's lab um, uh, and Brian Lee was the first author, published a, a, a kind of similar analysis or at least philosophically similar analysis. And um, what they did, and I think it's a really beautiful approach, um, is they applied a diffusion approximation to uh, this branching process that described um, the relative fitness of, of genotypes in the population. And they were able to, you know, this um, uh, kind of, uh, this relationship between um, diffusion, physical diffusion processes and mathematical diffusion processes um, has, has actually been in the genetic literature for, literature for a long time, um, uh, dating back to um, 
Kolmogorov and, and um, uh, really beginning with uh, Sewell Wright, um, uh, who, who worked on this in the 40s. The, the person who's worked the most on this uh, is, uh, is Japanese, was a Japanese scientist, Moto Kimura. Um, and had, had worked out that you can actually use diffusion processes really effectively to model changes in allele frequency um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, so what, what Lee and Bart and their colleagues did is they, they kind of resuscitated this old literature and showed that you could use this um, for inference uh, because you could um, uh, provide a, a closed form um, expression for uh, the likelihood of given allele frequency changes over time. And they use this um, to do something quite similar to, um, to this hierarchical, uh, philosophically similar anyway, to, to the Pyrenoid model. So Martin, um, and I think this is really cool, and I, I, you might want to, um, I, I would consider inviting Martin to talk more about this, but I would definitely take a look at, um, at this uh, paper, a preprint uh, from Martin that um, Fritz and I also collaborated on. Martin said, well, you know, that's a really cool idea, but actually the inference um, doesn't make a ton of sense. And, and Martin is very interested and skilled uh, at applying Bayesian methods to these high dimensional regression uh, problems. And he's developed some tools uh, that can apply uh, Bayesian variable selection um, when there's a likelihood that um, uh, can be uh, easily uh, manipulated um, in the, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, comparison of, of different um, essentially evidences under the likelihood uh, that you can use that to identify um, the variables in the model that are the, the most predictive. So uh, that you can use this as a regression subset selection tool uh, as, as well as to model the, um, the, the relative effect of the uh, different alleles. So the BVAS model, which is what Martin formulated, has this inclusion variable, uh, which is uh, the posterior inclusion probability. And that, along with the diffusion-based likelihood, has been incredibly powerful. The result is that when you apply um, the Lee and Barton approach, uh, which is uh, performs map estimation, there's this trade-off, which is a fundamental limitation of their approach. You can either... Um, set this regularization parameter tau at a relatively uh, small value. And in that case, you can, over here, you can accurately capture the growth rate in the population of the different lineages uh, with accuracy. However, you get an incredibly noisy uh, uh, Manhattan plot, or, or um, you end up assigning um, relative fitness to alleles that, that probably don't have um, an effect. In contrast, using MAP, uh, you um, uh, can set the regularization parameter such that uh, you get a relatively sparse Manhattan plot. However, when you do this, you get growth rates at the lineage level that don't accurately capture the dynamics of the different lineages in the population. And in fact, this is what we desire in a biological sense, because biologically, we think that most alleles are kind of along for the ride. There is this idea in biology that evolution is neutral for most alleles or nearly neutral. And so the ability to apply um, efficient variable subset selection um, uh, brings in this important uh, modeling assumption, uh, which is that most alleles are not contributing to the fitness of the strain, or that the um, that the the coefficient of most alleles is uh, is zero. Now, um, pi r naught uh, does do this um, to to some extent uh, through the uh, regularizing and sparsity inducing effect of the Laplace prior. But 
um, the the uh, ability to exploit the Gaussian likelihood um, and and do this uh, in an efficient um, uh, calculation of a of a principal Bayesian model um, is a really cool and unique feature of uh, BVAS. So I would just highlight um, that, which I I think. Um, uh, was uh, really nicely uh, done by, by by Martin, and I think um, just in the last uh, kind of couple minutes, I want to highlight that <clears throat> ultimately where we are now is um, both Pyronaut, BVAS, and MAP are telling us um, the same things about the pandemic. They're telling us that mutations in spike predominantly, but also in key regions outside of spike, um, uh, consistently uh, unexplored biology are uh, driving the fitness of this virus. The major effect seems to be this phase change in the pandemic where immune escape variants uh, that likely uh, reduce, uh, or in many cases, eliminate antibody binding uh, by antibodies that have been by either vaccination or prior infection, <coughs> excuse me, are the major driving effect on fitness. And some lineages have more plasticity than others or are better able to emit highly transmissible sublineages. And these are places where we should look to understand the biology uh, of the a lineage's capacity to emit <coughs> highly fit uh, child lineages. Um, and again, uh, th these effects uh, together have created this phase change um, for the pandemic. So overall, I think the, the key biological method is that we have <coughs> new, um, uh, new tools to understand the mutation specific effects on fitness. They largely agree, at least in a qualitative sense, um, major signals that are relatively well characterized in spike but also important signals that we need to characterize outside of spike. <coughs> um, and I, I'm kind of coughing now, so I think I'm just going to wrap up. Uh, but the, the bigger picture is that, you know, in genetics, we've focused so much on um, genes that underlie the basis of phenotypes. But in infectious disease, there's two genotypes. There's the host genotype and the microbial genotype. And I think with the combination of the amount of sequencing and biogenetics that's just exploded, this really offers an opportunity to characterize the <coughs> microbial determinants of um, distinct uh, phenotypes. And Bayesian hierarchical models that represent um, strain-specific phenotypes or other infectious phenotypes as a collection of the mutations that comprise a given strain are, I think, a very powerful way to dissect some of these effects. So <laughs> with that, uh, I apologize for all the coughing. Uh, I am going to stop there. And uh, I will um, leave time for some questions and, and discussions. I have a question uh, regarding the time. So how far in advance can you predict the fitness or how, when you talk about prediction, what is actually the prediction or, you know, in terms of the regression and how far in advance can you tell, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, depends what you want to know. So one limitation of the model is that it requires the mutation to be present in a region before it's included in the forecasting. So if a mutation has emerged in South Africa, the model isn't going to predict, even if it knows that the fitness of that model, that variant or that mutation is higher than other circulating variants, the model isn't going to predict uh, that that variant will dominate because it doesn't know that that variant will come here. The model doesn't have a, a, a mutation or it doesn't have a, a geographic component where there's exchange between places. So I think that um, with that limitation, 
once a variant is present, um, the forecasts tend to be quite good. Um, I would say for a month or two in advance or, or, or in the future. But what the model can't do is forecast the um, emergence of a completely new variant that is uh, far more transmissible than what is currently circulating. So, um, you know, when there was Delta, uh, the model couldn't forecast that Omicron was going to emerge and, and, and take over. Um, that seems to be happening every six months or so, uh, at least over the last <coughs> year or two. One thing that the model can do is it could assign a fitness to a hypothetical lineage. So uh, we could say that it showed a lineage emerge that looked like BA5, but also had mutations in say R346K, that would have this much uh, fitness advantage over the existing one. And so we can score lineages as they emerge. And that's useful. Uh, and then um, the model can also uh, track the dynamics of those lineages and improve the forecast over time. Um, in, the, in the paper, we, we looked to compare the, the performance of uh, this hierarchical model incorporating mutations to a non-hierarchical model that didn't have mutations. And we found that the mutations added something. Um, and I, I think this is this is one of the coolest things in my view about this approach, which is that it avoids the complexity of full phylogenetic inference, but it still captures the dependencies between strains. And it does it in a way that improves um, modeling accuracy uh, and also forecasting. But it, it does have limitations. And I, I think, um, you know, it definitely doesn't tell us like, you know, what's gonna be happening in six months from now. I have a couple of maybe naive questions. Um, the first one is, I think you said this way at the beginning, but I, I, I can't remember. The, the features you're using in the regression, are those single SNPs or are those some dimension, result of dimensionality reduction kind of thing first? That's a great question. I, I don't know if I said completely explained. So um, it's uh, there's a, a clustering to uh, reduce the dimensionality of the uh, data set. And then there, the feature matrix is uh, the proportion of lineages that have that amino acid substitution. So it's almost binary, like the mutation is either in the lineage or not, but it's actually, you can have, you know, between zero and one values. I see. So uh, it's like, it's not, it, it is a single nucleotide kind of th thing, but it's based not on kind of a standard SNP variation calling. It's based on first clustering into lineages and then finding a thing that's indicative of that lineage. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And the, the one thing to say is that we're only modeling the, the amino acid substitution. So um, the if there's um, synonymous SNPs that wouldn't induce an amino acid change, they're not modeled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess part of the reason I was thinking about that is I'm, I, I, oh, first I should say, this is lovely. I, I really uh, I really like this work. It's very cool. Um, and I'm kind of thinking like, can you do something like what you guys did with, you know, if you're in a situation where you have a lot less data. So I, I have some collaborators at Stanford who are genetic ecologists and they do these experiments where they like, you know, they'll sequence Arabidopsis around the world and, you know, they build a big data set of genomes for them, but it's much smaller than what you have. Um, and it feels like, you know, you're working at the, like, how do we deal with this massive data? And, but the Bayesian stuff should also help with kind of relatively smaller data. And, and so I guess, okay, one question is just like, you know, will that, is that true? Will it work? Another question is sort of like, is it possible in that very first phase to use maybe genomes from wider kind of, you know, less related species that aren't in lineages to just do some unsupervised representation learning to 
pull out some features that'll be useful to, to reduce the dimensionality. Yeah, so I mean, I think all great questions. And I would say like for both of them, I, I don't know. Um, and I'd be very curious to hear Fritz's thoughts, but but I, I mean, I think that um, we do wonder, but, like, so I, I mean, I think this is such a high dimensional problem um, that, that it, uh, you know, it probably does require an extraordinary amount of data. Um, and I think, you know, we're in a unique situation with SARS-CoV-2 where we have, you know, we had millions of genomes and now we have over 10 million genomes. Um, but <laughs> there are hundreds of thousands of influenza genomes, for example, and, um, you know, could this be applied to influenza? Uh, could you coursify the features um, mm -hmm. uh, um, if you needed to? I think yes. I mean, I, I think that um, this is what, to me, was so exciting about, about all of this, uh, which is that um, I think the idea of hierarchical models um, for genetics is so useful because it it really speaks to the biology of of genomes. There are there is a hierarchical structure to it. There's the genome, but there are also like the chromosomes and the genes and the mutations. And um, so I and you know for flu there's like the segments. So maybe you can't get down to the amino acid level like you can for SARS, but probably you could identify a segment of influenza that is associated with enhanced fitness. Um, and it's not just fitness. I mean, it could be other properties like, um, you know, virulence. So I think that the innovation here is um, just kind of like the hierarchical nature of the modeling and the ability to actually formulate these models in a probabilistic programming language. Now, I, I think that, you know, pyro is not easy to use for a novice. Um, I certainly couldn't have done what Fritz did, but I think it's learnable. Like I learned um, a fair amount about how to use Pyro during this project. And I definitely would use it and will use it in the future. Cause although the learning curve is steep, um, it's incredibly powerful. And I think this kind of modeling approach has many applications that we haven't scratched the surface of because it's been difficult to implement the model, you know, to, to implement um, these models. And so I, I think the idea of probabilistic programming um, uh, languages for this purpose has incredible legs. And I mean, if, <clears throat> you know, I think that the way that Pyro was built, um, the ability to scale to these really large data sets um, and, and to use variational inference it's gonna be really, really valuable. So um, I thought that, that for me was the best part of this project was just working with Fritz, kind of learning about some of this stuff. And I think it truly was a <coughs> multidisciplinary um, collaboration and, and fun learning experience. The, the second question that you asked um, was about uh, taking kind of a step back, I think in, in the phylogenetic tree and saying, um, can, we, can we look at different species or different, um, different types of, uh, not within SARS-CoV-2, but, but across different viruses and, and um, pull out features. Um, yeah, I, I think that that, that also um, has incredible potential. It probably involves different kind of modeling approaches and, and different, um, but I, I think that, yeah, that's- Yeah, really it's, really, it's really a question kind of about <laughs> generalization, um, you know, not knowing much about the biology, my mental model is that like, you know, even in say very different viruses, there's some conserved parts that will have similar effects. And so, you know, if you could do some unsupervised pre-training kind of thing to just, you know, look at all of the genomes that you've got that have some variation and compress them down to features that are likely to be features of, you know, of, of interest. Um, basically, because there's so much dis disequilibri disequilibrium linkage, there's a lot of compression that you should be able to get rid of by looking at, you know, stuff. Um, and that might kind of help reduce the data needs because, you know, once you've done that, you might need less data to rule out, um, you know, some things or, you know, some things that are correlated. I have no idea, uh, but just something I've been kind of 
pondering separately is like, how can we help the ecologists by doing something with like a lot of unrelated genome data? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I don't know. We we started talking with Debbie Marx's group a bit. And they they um kind of do something similar uh, where they they build these probabilistic generative models that um, take advantage of, uh, of high dimensional uh, well correlations between uh, amino acid substitutions. And they use that to learn um, kind of basic principles of protein design. And um, there are some incredible stuff that comes out of that. Uh, and these correlations also have, um, you know, largely structural implications because um, when mutations are correlated, uh, it's often because a mutation at one position makes it hard to maintain the original amino acid at the other position because they're they're in physical contact. Um, and and so uh, you know that kind of uh, um, spatial structure uh, is incredibly useful, um, but it's uh, I think unexplored um, and really exciting territory. Certainly, kind of out of my um, area of 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 knowledge, but um, I think you're you're really onto something. Yeah, one of the difficulties in in modeling epistasis in in um, in this project was that we had you know, kind of a lot of data, but it was very, uh, it was like side data. It was like we were we were um, trying to do a, a, a GWAS on the metadata, like the time fields on, of, of the genomes that were sampled. It, and and it, it was, you know, then we had to like first fit a logistic growth model, and then we could like infer the, the growth coefficients, and then we could do uh, make a Manhattan plot on top of that. So it was like this stack. And so there, th it ended up that we were, you know, pulling out a lot of information from kind of very low quality, large volume data. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that like we just had barely enough information to fit a, a, a linear additive model. Mm -hmm. And I think these, these kind of like Debbie Mark style models that could sparsify, you know, give a sparse prior on which pairwise coefficients were important. I think that might have helped us, but uh, mm. we, like it was a you know a level of complexity we, we really couldn't yeah. afford in terms of like labor labor costs, you know. That's also really interesting because it suggests that having you know more kinds of observations giving you more predictors, like you basically only had how much was there in the population. And I guess like if you also had like how much did this cause sneezing versus uh, you know loss of taste and just all of these things, that would give I mean, you a lot more signal to right, right. We know. had basically like this virtual phenotype. You know, our phenotype was the timestamp from which we inferred yeah. the growth rate, right? And so it was really un I think it was really unusual that to to try to pull to even have the audacity to like say like hey we can pull some signal out of there. You right. Know, I, I think a lot of people would have you know, if you, given up on the data. If you had access to full like full medical records, I guess you could in principle like add a bunch more features to each of these observations. But I guess in practice, that's one of these like, you know, terrible things that happens with medical data is it all gets separated and it's impossible to piece back together. Yeah, you'd, you'd need orders of magnitude less data if we had, you know, yeah. real phenotypes here. We, we, we had, you know, 10 to the sixth genomes or 10 to the 10 to the seventh genomes. And I think we needed so many because it's it's so little. To, like with, with, you know, three orders of magnitude less data, if we had phenotype tags, we could we could do the same regression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that and, and I mean. It's cool for the virus case, but also for the ecologist. That they that's what they tend to have is more like phenotype information. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really relevant. Hmm. Cool. I should run, but this was great and and you know, good to meet you, Jacob. Awesome to see great. you. Yeah. Thanks. You know, nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Thanks so much. All, All right. right. Thank you. Bye bye.